This is Morning Express and glad that you're here with us on this first day of December 2015. It is now 15 minutes after 7 right here in Nairobi, Kenya and reaching 11 countries within the region but also internationally in case you're streaming. Now, it's time for us to go on to person of interest and our person of interest this morning is one that needs very little introduction to many of us. Why? Because he has been in the news for many, many reasons. His way and style of doing things is not what you'd call conventional. He's not afraid to speak his mind and he will say what he needs to say, when he needs to say it, how he needs to say to get the point across. And I'm talking about none other than the man also known as the bullfighter. And that is Dr. Bonnie Halwale. And in case you've not met the man before, well, he's in the studio. If you have any questions that you have for him, feel free to tweet them. And the Twitter handle is at Michael G. Gitonga. His Twitter handle is at Bonim Tetezi and also uh, at KTN News. K. Bonim Tetezi. K. Bonim Tetezi. There you go. Uh, that's his Twitter handle. But uh, first of all, just uh, a few of the excerpts of some of the things we know about him. This is Boni Halwale. The problem of Mumias. Mambo ya Kidero, mwenyewe ya meniita tuende kotini, ni metengeneza ushaidi, I'm going to meet Kidero. So welcome into the studio, Dr. Boni Halwale. Thank Great you. to have you. you. Good morning. I know waking you up this early uh, is not easy. Is that uh, for you, it's, it's kawaida? It's a, a normal, it's, a, it's a normal thing. It's a normal thing. Yes, yes. Wanyonge huwa wala live late. Great to have you, sir. Yes. Now, let's start off first of all with just your background. Where, yes. where did Boni Halwale grow up? And, you know, what are some of those things you remember about your childhood? I was born on 5th of August, 1960. At Malinya in Kakamega, went to Malinya Primary School, Msingo High School, Kakamega High School, then went to the University of Nairobi, and there, thereafter, the rest is history. Mm -hmm. Yes. Did you foresee yourself going into politics as you were, uh, you know, in university, as you are growing up? Uh, I have uh, some element of association with politics in the sense that my mother's uh, nephew was the member of parliament for Ekolomani. So by that very nature, I became alive to political dynamics fairly early. Because every time that he was contesting and we were children, we would be forced to go to the home of Seth Logonzo and uh, camp there. And then immediately I came of age. I uh, not really came of age. When I went to school, I joined debating, which is usually the, the beginning of uh, a politician. Mm -hmm. And went on, then went into university student politics. Uh, thereafter, now I had been cut for politics to the extent that at the age of 22 at the University of Nairobi we were discontinued for one year four months because we had uh, participated in the uh, coup that removed Moi for 11 hours from power in 1982 mm -hmm. that was the first time I, I made my first political move and why you involved in the coup yes we were as students uh, we were mobilized and uh, we were sucked in mm -hmm. uh, it was not very well thought out uh, unfortunately, some of our leaders uh, lost their lives, uh, Titus and Tungusi. They should not have, because it was not something that was very well thought out. We were just sucked in. Uh, you know the excitement when students are, uh, are drawn into noise in the city center at midnight, and uh, there it went on and went on, and immediately the Air Force people realized that we were a very uh, positive addition to their course when the country saw that students were part of the uh, confusion and in the process the, the then president got very angry and dealt with us mercilessly. Mercilessly. Yeah. Uh, were you in agreement with uh, him being removed out of power or was it merely just a crowd moving? No, it was not a crowd moving. There were real issues. Uh, on the lead up to that uh, particular unrest, we had had a series of detentions without uh, trial uh, that was uh, climaxed by Jeramogi being put under house arrest. Mm -hmm. But prior to that, uh, uh, John Haminwa, the, the current lawyer, had been uh, detained without trial. Uh, George Kidi, the edi editor, uh, I think the editorial manager, at the then East African Standard, had also been detained without trial. And these were things that were very dear at the bottom of the hearts of the students because now 
we were fighting for political space. There was no freedom of the media. Just as we, we, it, it is still a problem today, it was even a bigger problem at that time. Mm -hmm. So we were adequately mobilized uh, emotionally and intellectually for us to support uh, the soldiers. Okay. Yeah. So did you, what, what is it that you wanted to do as you're growing up? You found yourself, you know, in the debating club and uh, as, as, as one of the leaders in university, but I'm sure you had a childhood dream when you're growing up. What is it yes. that you wanted to be? Uh, I made up a decision to become a doctor of medicine pretty early and uh, I am glad that I succeeded. Mm -hmm. And then when I was in medical school, uh, I recall in 1986, is when I, rem I made my decision now to go into elective politics. Uh, elective politics. Mm -hmm. uh, that is when now I'd become a student leader. Okay. Yeah, and I'm glad that it has come to pass. You're happy, no regrets? And none whatsoever. None whatsoever. Yes, yes. All right, tell me a little uh, bit about your family, your immediate family. In my immediate family, mm -hmm. I have uh, two parents who passed on. I have uh, seven siblings. Uh, who are still alive, uh, brothers, uh, six brothers and one sister. And then uh, I have got uh, my own family. I have several children, boys and girls. I have uh, uh, several wives and uh, they are the mothers of those children. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, in this day and age, one might say, how is it that uh, you live a polygamous uh, life? And you know, People normally think that polygamy is something that is very old-fashioned. Yes, uh, I have no problem in being an old-fashioned person mm -hmm. because I come from a very, uh, my parents were very old to the extent that by the time uh, my father uh, gave birth to me, he was in his 50s and my mother was 45. Uh, I was the last born uh, to, to them. Uh, but that is not the reason. The reason is that uh, I embrace Luya culture to the hilt. And uh, polygamy does not offen offend the Luya culture in any way. Mm -hmm. yeah. One might say that, uh, you know, even having one wife is quite a challenge. How do you manage it? Uh, first of all, how many do you have? Uh, how many? How many wives do you have? Uh, I think that should be subject of another discussion. <laughs> <laughs> I've already told you that I've got more than one. More than one. Yes, yes. Okay, you don't want yes. to go to the numbers. Uh, no, it, 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 doesn't, it, it doesn't add ma any value. That's why, in spite of having been in public limelight for all these years, you've never seen me with my children, you've never seen me with my wives, or any of my wives, because I believe that a high octane political personality like myself, if you suck in the family, you can create con con confusion. They should also pursue their own path. There are several children in my family who would want to have nothing to do with bullfighting, who would want to have nothing to do with politics. So why, why disturb them? Let each child uh, trust But one might say those are the values that uh, a nation looks at because strong families make strong societies. Exactly, and I'm glad that I have got such a strong family. But you don't display my first them, born don't son, uh, My firstborn son is an advocate of the high court. My secondborn daughter is an advocate of the high court. My thirdborn daughter is uh, an assistant manager in one of the uh, assistant human resource manager in one of the state parastotals. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, my fourth born son, is, he's an auditor, who works with an audit firm, and, and so on and so forth. They're there. Okay. Tell me a little <laughs> bit about your, your, your passion for bullfighting. Yes, bu uh, the, the bullfighting, yes. Bullfighting is slightly beyond passion. It is a cultural calling to the extent that Luya culture expects certain things from certain families. Mm -hmm. If you are born from the family of circumcisers, then you are predetermined to become a, a circumciser. Mm -hmm. I would not become a, a traditional circumciser, much as I do circumcision because of being a doctor of medicine. But traditionally, I don't come from that kind of family. Mm -hmm. You're not in that lineage. No. Mm -hmm. uh, when you come from the family of bullfighting, one of the sons will, b the, the bullfighting stick will be passed to you my father passed his to, my, to me. So y it is just not being emotionally involved, but you are culture, culturally expected to carry on uh, the practice. We have the families that do isukuti playing. They play isukuti, shiriri playing, litungu playing. These things are that well organized. Then traditional, f uh, b b b b uh, shall I say, medicine people. Not everybody can be. It runs in families. But one might argue and say that you don't uphold or we don't have to stick to all the cultures. So why have you stuck to that one? I've stuck on it because I'm well educated. I understand the meaning of culture. Mm -hmm. Even some of the, the so-called modern things, it is simply the culture of the white man. So when you are presumed to be 
practicing modern culture, it simply means you are aping the white man. And so uh, it doesn't disturb me. So what value does that add to you as uh, Boni Halwale, just being a bullfight? Is it just merely yes, 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 yes. Uh, theatrics? It, it, no, it is not theatrics. Eh? It uh, grounds me firmly in my culture. And you know, when you are cultured, you are a strong personality. You do not wave. For example, let me give you an example. If you were to come to Kakamega, the society of bullfighting, if you were to go to Bungoma, the epitome of Louis circumcision and uh, Teriki, you cannot find a, a single boy who is a homosexual. It's not possible. They, th they wouldn't understand because they are firmly grounded in it. So uh, these are the so strong would you say values. would you say that some of the challenges we are facing as yes. a society, yes. um, for instance, yes. what you've just mentioned, homosexuality, yes. is yes. a result of uh, not being culturally. Uh, grounded, yeah. Grounded. You are not uh, f culturally grounded, and uh, when you try to ape the other man's culture, then you cannot practice it as well as they do. And in the process, you run into challenges that completely confuse you. Mm -hmm. And these are serious things which you must address. Would you I, how, 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 how I wish we could all remember the old system of education where a child used to be educated in mother tongue from nursery up to class three. Mm -hmm. It was mandatory. Then you move on. I, that was part of the grounding. Now, these days, uh, thanks to urbanization, this has become a challenge and difficult. And secondly, children are starting to go to school too early. So you see, by us, the time we went to school at the age of seven, mm -hmm. you had already gone through the school of culture. But you see, when you take a child to baby class at, at three years, they will never learn anything in terms of culture. So, so would you subscribe to us going back to our cultural roots and how would we do that? It is easy. In fact, that conversation is already taking place in the Ministry of Education and uh, I want to applaud them for the same. Mm -hmm. It would be a good thing mm -hmm. for children to be taught in their mother tongue in the formative years before now they start getting uh, the modern education. And by the way, it is a proven uh, medical fact that a child who is given one language for the first five years of life, then finds it easier to learn a second, a third, and fourth language thereafter. Mm -hmm. But when you're mixed up, half Kiluya in the morning, half Kiswahili in the middle of the day, English, when your, your, your elder brother comes in, you end up having no command, clear one, in any one language. Do all your children then speak Luya? Mm -hmm. They do. All of them? Yeah, in, including those ones whose mothers are not Luyas. How did you manage to do that? <laughs> we just speak. Because <laughs> <laughs> if the mother is not Luya, then how, who is speaking to the child? The mother. So th or they've also had to learn yes, Luya? Yes, they learn. Yes. Okay. Yes. Wonderful. So um, <laughs> <laughs> that is interesting. Yes, uh, yes. In terms of the future for Boni Khalwale, what yeah. do you see yourself doing in politics? Where do you want to end up in politics? Uh, in politics, you do not have a predetermined end. To pretend that uh, you are going to end up being X, Y, Z, is to imagine that you have some form of uh, entitlement to national positions. But one needs to plan and have, you know, like a focus. This is what I'm focused on. Yes, uh, currently I'm highly focused, but I was just uh, preempting it so that uh, somebody doesn't think I have a sense of personal entitlement to national positions. Mm -hmm. National positions are not hereditary. Mm -hmm. You have to go to the people and ask for their support. I'm glad that uh, I have been receiving the people's support so far. Uh, in the next election, we will also be going back. I have changed my mind about being senator. I want to discharge a little bit as an executive now that I've been discharging as a people's representative. And I'm starting this by being the, the governor for Kakamega. So that's there your after we will, yeah, 2017. Thereafter, we will make another decision. Mm -hmm. This is not to say that I do not have the prerequisite qualifications to become something other than governor. Mm -hmm. If uh, his uh, fate was to force me, I would still run for deputy president and run for president of the Republic of Kenya. Do you see yourself ever running for president or deputy yes, president of, of course. Kenya? Yes, of course. It's just a matter of time. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of time. In fact, some of the disappointment I see in the way national events are being managed is the reason why I am in a big run to become... What are some of those disappointments? The biggest disappointment is that we continue to fail, not just in Kenya, but in Africa, to realize that our number one uh, enemy is poor leadership in guiding a nation on the critical issue of 
governance. Mm -hmm. And the backbone of governance is a president to know the difference between what is mine and what is ours. What is defined. mine mm -hmm. is, for example, when you go into the office, you are told your salary is this much. This is mine. The balance of the money that you control is ours. It is the Commonwealth of the Republic. Let me give you an example. And because he has already sued me, I know he won't sue me another time. Mm -hmm. The deputy president has sued me because of the pronouncements I made on the current land, mm -hmm. current land soccer. So let me co comment on him. His salary is 1.4 million shillings. We know this. He contributes in Harambe's in excess of 10 million shillings every month. How on earth would you justify One that? One could argue he's in business. He's a businessman. He's got other businesses that he's running. You want to make all Kenyans to laugh at that comment? That is what, an business, what business would you be running unless you're dealing in drugs? And I have reason to believe that he's a very religious man. He doesn't do drugs. What business would you be doing that would allow you to be siphoning out of the business, working capital, and throwing it away at 10 million every week. But Bonnie Mtetezi, can, and the can, same can, can, argument you're making yes. that uh, what business would you be doing because it is vague, we don't know. Uh, it's the same argument one could make and say, but possibly there is a business one could be doing. Let me tell you, it is serious. And as, I'm, uh, as a professional in the media, never be guarded when you're dealing with corruption. Corruption is a very bad thing. For every one million you hear Deputy President Uhuru has donated, he normally accompanies it with another one million from the president. And all that retinue of leaders in the name of MPs and M MCS that you see him with, he usually distributes to them before they come to make their contribution 100,000 shillings each. So if they are 10, that is another one million. And sometimes he has 10, 20 of them. And MCS, they'll be given between 20 and 50,000. So by the time you see one million given by the president, there is a million given by the four, the president, and another two, three million shared for the other people who have accompanied him, so that it looks like the guy has got cloud. So we are talking about, for example, where you see him recorded as spending 10 million. You might have found that he's in that particular month, he might have spent 10 times three. So that is 30 million per month. The, you cannot justify this, and this is corruption because Harambe's feed on corruption, period. You cannot change it. I'm old enough. I have been in uh, activism before I went to parliament for many years. Yes, sir. I know that this is the case. Okay, now, unfortunately or fortunately, yes. we cannot validate what you... Can you validate what you're saying, or can you prove what you're saying? Because at the end of the day, uh, where are you saying this money is coming from? Where is Bonnie Khalwale saying this uh, money is coming from? From corruption. That's what I'm saying. How it do you, is, how it do is you, up to... It, it is up to... It's a challenge. As a public officer, you are expected to be accountable to the people. If he was donating this in his private capacity, when he is not our deputy president, then it would be wrong for us to question. But because he's a public officer, the law expects that he be accountable. And that is in Article 73 of the Constitution, plus the various accompanying acts. So we are not in any way slandering him. We're just asking him, we challenge you that we fear this could be corruption. Can you clarify? Okay. It is then up to him, sir to then come out and say, this is the source, and therefore, I'm so a clean man. So it's more of a question to the deputy president, where is the money coming from? Where is it's it not an accusation that it is uh, 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 money that is corruptly. Exactly. It's a question, and it is him to now justify. It is not figures uh, thrown from space. It is a record of what he does in Akio mm -hmm. The last I was with him was in uh, Mumiasi. Uh, b b b b b Catholic Church, where he donated uh, one million for himself, one million for the for the president. Akina Dwale were there, Professor Kindiki were there, giving their hundreds of thousands, and so on. And I came with my usual little contribution. How and much the, did you contribute? Uh, well, ask the people. Well, I, 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 I on that day, <laughs> on that day, I contributed fifty thousand, and and, and, and my people were very happy. In fact, they were shocked that uh, I have upped it up to fifty thousand. 
And in our humble way, it is usually very difficult to reach there. And that 50,000 was from your own earnings. It was not... Uh, yes, I'm well paid. As a, as a senator of Kakamega, mm -hmm. I, I, I am paid uh, b b setting allowance. I'm a paid uh, mileage claim. I am paid an actual salary. So you, you take home more or less something like one million shillings. Surely you can organize yourself in one to million get to get 50,000. All right, let's talk about corruption yeah. in this country because yes, that's yes. one of the hugest, uh, yeah. can I call it a dragon's head that uh, exactly. uh, we've tried to deal with for a long, exactly. long time and seems to be um, not going away. First of all, let's start with the cabinet reshuffle. Yeah. What's your take on the president's cabinet reshuffle and his uh, attempt in dealing with uh, corruption? I think the most important comment which Kenyans must start with is what informed that reshuffle. It is the fear that corruption was now making his government very unpopular that the president attempted to do the reshuffle. There's no other reason. Now, so in, in short, are you trying to say that he was not trying to deal with corruption? It's just trying to deal with no. perception. No. The president was responding to that perception that his government was very corrupt. And he therefore wanted to, send a wanted to send a message that I've gotten rid of the corrupt ones and you know their names, there are six of them. Mm. Uh, they, they are either facing court cases or some of them like Waiguru have resigned. Now, in the process of sending that message, what then we should answer is, have we seen evidence that he is therefore in the new appointments on the path to fighting corruption? The answer is no. Why? Because now when you analyze, you find what he was actually doing was political expediency to try and up up his chances in various regions and communities for his chances of re-election in 2017. This way. In Kericho, the Kipsigis community was starting to look like Isaac Ruto, the governor, was overpowering everybody. So he thinks that by raising Keter to be somebody who is a member of the executive, then he will have another powerful person to counter Isaac Ruto. How I wish he had asked political analysts. They would have told him he won't get it. In fact, when Keter was senator, he was more active politically. Well, he'll control state resources now that he's a minister. Energy is a very resourced uh, docket. However, mm. the constitution does not expect him to do a lot of politics. So now Isaac Ruto will have a failed day. So on that one, he has fallen flat on his face. Mm. Secondly, the appointment of Chunjuri. People might think he wanted to fight corruption in devolution. No. Chunjuri is a headache to Uhuru. Unknown to Kenyans, Chunjuri leads something called the GNU party. And this GNU party is actually the one that was giving Uru sleepless nights. Not many Kenyans know that TNA did not get any political leadership, serious, mm -hmm. in uh, Nyeri. Chunjuri, being from Laikipia, they are originally from Nyeri. A governmentary opposition, TNA did not get. Senator, TNA did not get. And many MCAs and so on and so forth. So the president wants to ameliorate the process by appointing the boss of GNU so that then GNU gets swallowed and goes into jail. Okay. And then finally, at the cost, uh, Dan Kazungu. Dan Kazungu is an ODM uh, member of parliament. So what befell uh, TNA in uh, Kajiado when they uh, appointed Ngaiseri is waiting to befall TNA in the uh, uplifting of uh, Dan Kazungu. Okay. So he has achieved nothing. <coughs> he's playing politics, he's not fighting corruption. So, so in short, what you're saying is that the Jubilee government is not interested in fighting corruption uh, from uh, what they have seen. You've not not seen in the list, they are not. Question, if it was you, what would you do if well, you were in their position of uh, fighting corruption? How, what, what is it that you would do differently to fight corruption? In Kenya? If I was responding to the need to reshuffle cabinet in order to fight corruption, and then I would appoint people. It doesn't matter that you appoint them from the National Assembly or the Senate or wherever. But I would appoint people who do not have suspect CVs. Kenyans are waiting to see the vetting process of these new appointees. We want to see what MPs will ask Njunjuri about the corruption 
that took place at the Ministry of Water, for which he, had, he went into a serious fallout with Charity Ngilu. In fact, they wrote to each other and insulted each other on the floor of the house and so on and so forth. We are waiting. We are waiting to see the questions they'll ask Charles Keter. Charles Keter was arrested and arraigned in court uh, for having, uh, in quotes, stolen uh, millions of shillings when he was a senior manager at, uh, at uh, Kenya Telecoms. Mm -hmm. So we want to see. He would have gone for clean guys. And they are there. Even if he wanted people from his communities, so, they so, are there. So in short, what you're saying, if the yeah, government yeah. should be looking for people with, uh, like the proverbial saying, Caesar's wife with no reproach. Exactly. Okay, let's come to the party that you are in, and that is, uh, you're, you're in the opposition. Yes. How come you've not used the same energy to pluck out those who have similar uh, issues and questions. Right now, in today's dailies, we have uh, Wetangula with uh, a case yes, yes. which uh, apparently um, you know, uh, may, have, uh, may have been compromised by BAT. Yes, we yes. also do know that as Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, there was the issue with the uh, uh, embassy in Japan. On top of that, we do know that there's a, there's a case that is pending where he may lose his seat as Senator. Uh, with uh, issues of bribery. How come the opposition has not used the same energy to make sure that even within your leadership, you have leaders who are with no reproach, just like Caesar's wife? I want Kenyans to understand where is the position, where is the opposition, and where is Jubilee. Where the opposition has got the biggest say, it is in A, the court of public opinion, and B, in this le legislative arm of government, period. The opposition has no other voice. Now, when you are in the legislative arm of government, you do exactly what you see us doing, both in public and also on the floor of parliament. In the court of public opinion, you galvanize the public on topical national issues that require attention. When it comes now, to those who are in the executive arm of government. It is the executive arm of government which is responsible for implementation. So if we have spoken on the issue of corruption and pointed out people who are corrupt, corrupt. Mm -hmm. we cannot go any further than that because we are not in control of implementation. It is the executive that controls the CID, mm -hmm. that controls the DPP, that controls the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission. Mm -hmm. So if the executive was with the same energy as COD, then they would be moving beyond just the fact that you have spoken about it, walk the talk, and implement. But they say charity begins at home. Yes. So really we should see the opposition also saying, look, okay, let me we, are, we, are, we are government in waiting. And as government in waiting, yes. we have a clean house here. Anybody that has <coughs> any questions... Let's not have them on board as our leaders. Because okay, okay. these are the same leaders who are going to lead the country should the opposition take over uh, the government. Yeah, precisely. And I want to uh, refer you to two strong statements I've made. I am currently strongly in defense of Wetangula on the issue of mention of IEBC. And I am also one of the people who are on record having spoken on the issue of Wetangula, having been involved in corrupt deals at the Tokyo Embassy. And what is my position? My position, I have been urging the executive to use due process to deal with Wetangula. If it is true that Wetangula bribed voters, that's a criminal offense. He should not be subjected to any other process other than being arraigned in court and charged with a criminal offense of bribery. Instead of them doing that, so that that is concluded after being heard, instead they run to a civil process that took place in a petition and they say that is proof. That is not proof. You have to go to a criminal process that, as the lawyers put it, that allows the senator to be subjected to proof beyond may I conclude yeah, yeah, go uh, to, to, to be subjected to proof beyond a reasonable doubt you cannot end the career <laughs> of a person be it uh, in uh, bullfighting or whatever mm -hmm. when you have Based not given him the, the due process proof. that's mm -hmm. what we are saying look at what the, uh, uh, professor Kito said I was shocked how a professor of law could say that they have decided 
he has advised his legal opinion that IEBC should give Wetangula a hearing so that Wetangula can explain himself out, failing which he'll be struck out. That is not due process. IEBC is not the Supreme Court, it is not the High Court, it is not the Court of Appeal, it is not a district resident magistrate court. They should subject Senator Wetangula to the due process, i.e. So put as, him uh, as far to as a criminal uh, trial. As far as uh, Dr. Boni Halwale is concerned, yes, yes. Uh, Wetangula is guilty. I mean, is 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 innocent. I take uh, is innocent yes. until proved guilty. Yes. So why do you apply a different uh, notion for Waigoro, for example? That isn't she innocent until proven guilty? Wh what have we said? We have not said jail Waiguru. Yes, but we you, have you, never said. We, we have said. Yes, you we have said. to step aside like the rest. Uh, can, I, can, I, can I repeat? Mm -hmm. We have not said that jail Waiguru. We have said that Waiguru step aside, so, so that the due process can commence. I.e., you cannot investigate an officer who is in the same office that you are investigating. There is information. His secretary, the T girl, everybody, the office messenger have, but because of the presence of the boss. They intimidate. I am the one who said Wetangula should step aside so that he could be investigated for Tokyo. He stepped aside. Mm -hmm. And after he stepped aside, due process took place and he was returned. So what, what contradiction is there? Mm -hmm. So Waiguru, she did very well to resign, but only that she did it too late. We were not asking for too much. If Wetangula was in an executive position, we would be saying that because of the IEBC uh, question, he should step aside to be investigated. Thank God he is not. So they can go there, do their investigations while he's still representing the people of Bungoma. Okay. We'll come to uh, your stand on Mumia Sugar and yes, also yes. a row that you had with the governor for Nairobi, yes, Evans yes. Kedero. Yes. Uh, but just a reminder of what Boni Halwale is on record saying regarding uh, corruption. And uh, here we have it. I have donated my intellectual con in property to the fight against corruption. I will move with President Uhuru to ensure that Wala Mawana Pora Malia Inji, Malia Uma, Wote, Warudisha Yomani, Na Asrikali Kipenda, Uwafunge Kulekamisi. What exactly did you mean with those statements? Uh, exactly. That, that is coming shortly after the president addressed a joint setting of uh, the two houses of parliament. Right. And we were very happy with him. Mm -hmm. So we were saying, this is it. We will support you. You now have made the first positive step. But what, what has come to pass? That was supposed to, uh, just to please the public. It was the PR that the Jubilee government is well known for. As soon as they did that, we thought they were on course. Then he set his so-called tyranny of numbers in Parliament to get all the commissioners of ethics and anti-corruption haunted out of office. And then they killed ethics and anti-corruption commission. So things could not move. A very big disappointment. Now that that has gone down, they have now decided to go to another PR range and therefore they have brought this reshuffle, which I've already discussed. Okay. I want to come to some of the questions that are coming through via Twitter. There are quite a number. But before we go there, uh, let's talk about Mumia Sugar Company. Yes. And uh, there are claims uh, from some of your uh, critics yes, yes. that you received money from Kidero to sort out the issue that was there. Yes, yes. Uh, and what he was going to sue you for in regards to the statements you made about him. Yes. Is that true? Or what would you like to say about that? One, I stand by every remark I made concerning Governor Kidero. Two, I cannot discuss it because at the moment there is a gag order, an injunction that was put against me not to discuss Kidero and Mumiasi matters. Until this is set aside, I am very guarded because I want to be seen to respect the rule of law. However, the minimum I can say is that any other rumor should be overridden by the fact that on 20th of January 2016, we came from court on 19th of November. The case between Haluala and Gidero is active and ongoing. So if I had received any money, the case would not be 
active. So it has not been settled out of it court? It has yet. not been settled out of court. There are no such arrangements. What you saw in the newspaper that out of court settlement, it is on a, an, another application. There had been an application by Kidero that Ahmed Nasser be blocked from representing me as a lawyer. So we then asked uh, the lawyers of Kidero, how does it help your case? Which lawyer I use? Ahmed Nasser is one of the top lawyers in the country, but if you remove him, I will still get another top lawyer, and there are many that I can use. It is not helping you. So they said in that case, we are having a second reflection. We want to withdraw the application that Ahmed Nasser should be blocked from representing you. So that is the bit. Otherwise, as far as the case, the, the court case is concerned, the process is ongoing. The so-called uh, 12.5 million that I'm alleged to have been, to have been bribed with, given. it was evidenced by a banking slip, a banking slip which was a forgery. And uh, we, the, the cooperative bank where I do my banking has already clarified that there is not such account. They have already clarified that on the, my bona fide accounts in the, in the bank, there has never been that kind of transaction. Mm -hmm. So we are sitting pretty. This is an attempt to make me look small, to make me look petty, mm -hmm. to make me look corrupt. I'm committed to fighting corruption. How I wish I would be a billionaire like some of my age mates, mm -hmm. some of my contemporaries in politics. Mm -hmm. But I've chosen a different path, the path to defend public funds. Okay. Yeah. You sometimes do things which are unconventional yes. and uh, as a leader, one may wonder why you do such things. For example, there's a, there's a funeral that apparently you attended and you went in through the fence. Yes. And uh, this, of course, caused commotion. <coughs> uh, they wanted you to go out and go. But why, why do you uh, choose to take such a path? As a leader, people are looking up to you. The children who look up to Boni Halwale as their uh, leader. Exactly. That was a funeral in uh, Malaba sub-county, uh, occasioned by the death of a former chief, mm. uh, Chief Erabonga. Not a former, a, a chief who died in office, right. Erabonga. It was amazing that the Star newspaper, which sometimes it is, it's hard to know whether it operates as alternative media, gutter press, or conventional media, and then came up with that story, which was manufactured from nowhere. So you didn't go through the fence? We did not go through the fence. But to, to make people happy, I want you to know that we have since sued the star for this particular slur and slander. Because it was a lie. So why, why would the bullfighter go through the gate, the side, uh, the, the fence? In any case, when the bullfighter arrives in a function like that, it's usually a case of uh, pandemonium, so to speak. The youth run, the women sing, the men... It, you, you cannot, therefore, uh, divert yourself through <laughs> the fence. You go through the real function. So, so it, is this, it is this imagination mm -hmm. that we carry around our cloud that sometimes uh, the, the offends our competitors to the extent that they would want to maybe pay section of the weak media to be unethical and unprofessional. Okay. All right, let me go to some of the questions that are coming through. We have uh, <coughs> Francis Abuti, and he says, ask Bonim Tetezi why he wants Mudavadi back in ODM, whereas uh, he was one of the ones who vocally advised him out. Thank you. Mudavadi is well advised not to join ODM. Mm -hmm. I would not advise Mudavadi to join ODM at all. He has done the right thing. He has formed ANC. If I had not stood my ground at the cost of almost losing my seat as senator in confirming to Mudavidi that UDF was not his party, it was prearranged to mess his political career, Mudavidi would still be in UDF now. So I'm glad that he hid our advice and he has formed ANC. Mudavidi strengthened ANC. You never know who else will join you but people will join you after you have proven yourself. Having formed ANC, Mudavadi should now delink himself from Jubilee and come and join the opposition because he is not in the government to join the opposition. And the opposition in Kenya is called the Coalition for Reforms and Democracy. He joins that coalition as ANC. He will fight for his space 
from within. But to tell us that he's going to form some Mongorel called a third force, not in Kenya. The election of 2017, just like the election of 2007, 2013, 2002, will always be two horse races. What is your feeling on uh, the Okoa Kenya bill? The Okoa Kenya bill, we are the drafters of the bill. Mm -hmm. We are the ones who are driving the bill. It is the future of the country. That is why you have seen quickly, Jubilee has agreed with us. Lakini, Shingo Pande. Instead of just saying we support Okoa Kenya, they are saying uh, uh, Poresha, Katiba. Poresha Katiba. They are just simply agreeing <laughs> Shingo Pande. So that's the future of the country. All right. And I want to thank them for uh, joining. For doing that. Yeah, All yes, right. Yes. Uh, we have uh, Sambalaka who wants to know, uh, or rather your comments on the issue of mismanagement at PGH Kakamega. Yes, it is very sad. We have come out strongly. Unfortunately, two ladies, one a university student, another one a patrol attendant, Elizabeth Akala, mm -hmm. and uh, the, the other one, Abigail, uh, they, they lost their lives. They didn't lose their lives because they had to. The reason, members of the public, why hospitals were invented, mm -hmm. or rather, to be uh, precise, why maternities were invented by scientists, it is for the very reason that scientists did not want babies to die at birth and worse off mothers to die at birth. That was the reason why maternities were invented. So in Kakamega, it is the failure of the Oparanya health management system that is the reason for that death. Why? He is sitting on hundreds of millions, and if time will allow, I'll go in quickly, hundreds of million that have come from devolution to go and fund the health sector. He's sitting on that, those millions. They are on their account as we speak now. Instead of using those funds to A, hire enough nurses. In that hospital, I have run that hospital before as an MOH in Kakamega. It has got a capacity of 900, 920 nurses. Oparanya has employed only 200. When you ask him, employ more, he says that there is a capping on the, num on the amount of money you can use on employees mm -hmm. so I can only employ those many nurses. What, what, a lie, because mm -hmm. he has enough money. Instead of employing nurses, he then employs youth militia okay, we who, who accompany him in the name of... Uh, we, ne we need to wind up, but what have you done to ensure that, that something is done about that? Because really, as much as if he's sitting on those millions and you know that, yes. what are you doing to ensure that Kakamega is a better place to live in? Yes, we have summoned them to the Senate to come and be accountable. Uh, first, we invited him three times according to the law. He didn't come. And then we summoned him. He didn't come. And now the Senate has written to the Director of Public Prosecutions mm -hmm. so that he's arrested and either frog marched to come to the committee to be accountable or he is charged in a court of law for contempt of court. So would you say that We've Oparanya taken is uh, single-handedly more or less uh, failing Kakamega? Once leadership fails, whether it is collective or single-handedly, mm -hmm the entire system fails. Okay. Let me give you an example. We need to wind up. Yes, very, very let briefly. me give you an example very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. Because Kibaki, unfortunately, he was not so well. Because he was up to it in terms of leadership. You saw you no occasion where Kibaki was in a harambe. You saw the economy grow. Mm -hmm. But because Uhuru has failed, he's not up to it. The economy is going down. They have taken the country back to Harambe's. Corruption is on the top. All so right. it is always I the issue of leadership, leadership failure. Okay. All right, Bonim Tetezi, we'll have to wind it up right there. I and now I'm so short with you. There's so much that we could have discussed. But thank you very much for coming into the studio. And I'm sure we'll be having you uh, more and more often. Thank you very much, sir. Asante sana. All right. That's, uh, thank you. That's where we're going to wind up Morning Express this morning in our person of interest. Thank you so very much for your participation. There's quite a number of tweets and questions that were coming through. Unfortunately, we're not able to read and deal with all of them. But this is where we wind up. But do stand by. We've got News Hour coming in just a bit.